from part 14 of our reading of William Goldman's The Princess Bride, A Hot Fairy Tale. Um, we're going to go over the copyright information first, which should be on the screen now. It clearly says that it is um, copyright 1973 by to William Goldman. Um, let me find the page here. There it is. I don't know if that's not the right page. And it clearly says... All rights reserved, published in the United States by Ballantine Books, a division of Random House Incorporated, New York, and simultaneously in Canada by Ballantine Books of Canada Limited, Toronto, Canada. Also, it gives the Library of Congress number and all the different editions. And it says the cover art is by Norman Green. Now, um, we're going to go back to this. In the last part, um, Wesley and Buttercup were headed to the fire swamps or something like that and um they were being pursued by um humperdinck prince humperdinck and his armies and um they're talking about the recon the reconciliation reconciliation of wesley and buttercup on the ravine floor and we're going to um start over from the start here at this point in the story, my wife wants to know that she feels violently cheated not being allowed the scene of reconciliation on the ravine floor between the lovers. My reply to her is simply this. A. Each of God's beings from the lowliest on up is entitled to at least um, some at least a few moments of genuine privacy. B. What actually was spoken while moving enough for those involved at the actual time, flat, uh, flattens like toothpaste when transferred to paper for li later reading. My dove, my only, bliss, bliss, etc. C. Nothing of importance in, in an expository way was related because every time Buttercup began, let me tell, let me about, uh, tell me about yourself. Wesley quickly cuts her off with later, beloved. Now is not the time. However, it should be noted, in fair in fairness to all that, one, he did weep, two, her eyes did not remain precisely dry, three, there was more than one embrace, and four, both parties admitted that without any qualifications whatsoever, they were more than a little glad to see each other. Besides, five, within a quarter of an hour, they were arguing. It began quite innocently, and the two of them kneeling facing each other wesley holding her perfect face in his quick hands when i left you he whispered you were already more beautiful than anything i dared to dream in our years apart my imaginings did their best to improve on your perfection at night your face was forever behind my eyes and now i see that that vision who kept me company in my loneliness was a hag compared to the beauty now before me. Enough about my beauty, Buttercup said. Everybody always talks about how beautiful I am. I've got a mind, Wesley. Talk about that. Throughout eternity, I shall do that very thing, he told her. But now we haven't time. He made it to his feet. The ravine fall had shaken and battered him, but all his bones survived. The trip uncracked. He helped her to her feet. Wesley, Buttercup said then, just before I started down after you, while I was still up there, I could hear you saying something, but the words were indistinct. I've forgotten whatever it was. Terrible liar. He smiled at her and kissed her cheek. It's not important, believe me. The past has a way of being past. We must not begin with secrets from, from each other. She, she meant it. He could tell that. Trust me, he tried. I do. Tell me. Uh, so tell me your words, or I shall be given reason not to. Uh, Wesley sighed. What I was trying to get through to you, beloved sweet, was... Um, sweet, what I was, as a matter of accurate fact, shouting with everything I had left was... Whatever you do, stay up there. Don't come down here, please. You don't want to see me. Of course, I wanted to see you. I just didn't want to see you down here. Why ever not? Because now, my precious, we're more or less kind of trapped. I can't climb out and I can't climb out of here and bring you with me. 
without it taking all day. I can't get out myself, most likely, without it taking all day. But with the addition of you of your lovely bulk, it's not about to happen. Nonsense. You climbed the cliff of in, the cliffs of insanity, and that isn't nearly as steep. And it took a little out of me, too. Let me tell you, and after that little effort, I tangled with a fella who knew a little something about fencing. And after that, I spent a few happy moments grappling with a giant. And after that, I had to outsmart a Sicilian. To, I had to, out, to outfake a Sicilian to death when any mistake meant it was a knife in the throat, a, a, knight, a knife in the throat for you. And after that, I've run my lungs out a couple of hours. And after that, I was pushed 200 feet down a rock ravine. I'm tired, Buttercup. Do you understand tired? I've put in a night. Um, I've put in a night is what I'm trying to get through to you. I'm not stupid, you know. Quit bragging. Stop being rude. When, uh, when was the last time you read a book? The truth now. And picture books don't count. I mean, something with print in it. Buttercup walked away from him. There are other things to read than print, she said. And the princess of Hammerstein and Hammersmith is displeased with you and is thinking seriously of going home. With no more words, she whirled into his arms and said, Oh, Wesley, I... I didn't mean... I didn't mean that. I didn't, I didn't. Not a single uh, syllabub of it. Now Wesley knew that she meant to say... Now Wesley knew that she meant to say not a single syllable of it because a syllabub was something you ate with cream and wine, mixed it together to form the base. But he also knew an apology when he heard one. So he held her very close and shut his loving eyes and only whispered, I knew it was fa false, believe me, every single syllabub. And that... Uh, and that out of the way, they started running as fast as they could along the rock, the rock floor of the ravine. Wesley, naturally enough, was considerably, uh, was considerably ahead of Buttercup with the realization that they were heading into the fire swamp. Whether it was a touch of sulfur riding a breeze or a flick of yellow flame far ahead in the daylight, he could not say for sure, but once he realized what was about to happen, he began to casually, as, as pa casually as possible, try to find a way to avoid it. A quick glance up at the sheer ravine sides ruled out any possibility of him getting Buttercup past the, cl past the climb. He dropped to the ground as he had been doing every few minutes to test the speed of, of their trackers. Now he guessed them to be less than half an hour behind and gaining. He rose and ran with her faster, neither of them spending breath in conversation. It was only a matter of time before she understood what they were about to be into, so he decided to beat back her panic in another way possible. I think we can slow down for a bit now, he, tr he told her, slow, slowing down a bit. They're still well behind us. Buttercup took a deep breath of relief. Wesley made a show of checking their surrounding, their surroundings. Then he gave her the, his best smile. With any luck at all, he said, we should soon be safely in the fire swamp. Buttercup heard his speech, of course, but she did not. But, but she did not. She did not take it well. A few words now, or to uh, a few words now on two related subjects. Fire swamps in general, and to the Florin Gilder fire swamp in particular. One, fire swamps are of course entirely misnamed. As to why this this has happened, no one knows. There's probably a colorful quantity of the two words to get uh, together is enough. Uh, is enough. Simply, there are swamps which contain a large percentage of sulfur and other gas bubbles that burst continuing to flames. They are covered with lush, giant trees 
that shadow the ground, making the flame bursts seem particularly dramatic, but they are dark, and they are also, they are almost always quite moist, therefore attracting the standard insects and the insect and alligator community that prefer a moist climate. In other words, a fire swamp is just a swamp, period. The rest is embroidery. The Florin Gilder fire swamp did the um, did and does have some particular odd characteristics. Um, the existence of the the snow sand and the presence of the rouse, R O U S, about which a bit more, about which a bit more later. Snow sand is usually again incorrect, incorrectly identified with lightning sand. Nothing could be less accurate. Lightning sand is moist and basically destroys by drowning. Snow sand is as powdery as anything short of talcum and destroys by suffocation. Most uh, particularly, though, the Florin Gilder fire swamp was used to frighten children. There was not a child in either country that at one time or another was not, when misbehaving very badly, threatened with ab abandonment in the fire swamp. Do that one more time, you're going to the fire swamp. Is a common, oh, is as common as clean your plate. People are starving in China, and so as children grew, so did the danger of the fire swamp. In their enlarging imagination, no one, of course, ever actually went into the fire swamp. Although every year or so, a diseased rouse, R O U S, might wander out to die, and its discovery would only add to the myth and the horror. The largest known fire swamp is, of course, within a day's drive of Perth. It is impenetrable and over 25 miles square, and one and fi oh, 25 miles square. The one between Florin and Gilder was barely a third that size. No one had been able to discover if it was impenetrable or not. Buttercup stared at the fire swamp. As a, as a child, she had once spent an entire nightmare year convinced, convinced that she was going to die there. Now she could not move another step. The giant trees blackened the ground ahead of her. From every part came the sudden flames. You cannot ask it. You cannot ask it of me, she said. I must. I once dreamed I would die here. So did I. So, so did we all. Were you eight that year? I was. Eight? Six? I can't remember. Wesley took her hand. She could not move. Must we? Wesley nodded. Why? Now is not the time. He pulled her gently. Uh, she, could, she still could not move. Wesley took her in his arms. Child, sweet child, I have a knife. I have my sword. I, do, I did not come across the world to lose you now. Buttercup was searching for something for... Uh, was searching somewhere for a, a sufficiency of courage. Evidently, she found it in his eyes. At any rate, hand in hand, they moved into the shadow, uh, the shadows of the fire swamp. So the shadows of the fire swamp. This ought to be good. Prince Humperdinck just stared. He sat astride a white, studying the footsteps down on the floor of the ravine. There was simply no other conclusion. The kidnapper had dragged his princess into it. Count Ruger sat alongside. Did they actually go in? The prince nodded. Praying the answer would be no, the count asked, Do you think we should follow them? The prince shook his head. They'll either live, live or die in there. If they die, I have no wish to join them. If they live, I'll greet them on the other side. It's too far, it's too far around, the count said. Not for my whites. We'll follow the best we can, the Count said. He stared again at the fire swamp. He must be very desperate, or very frightened, or very stupid, or very brave. Very, very all four, I should, th I should think, the prince replied. Wesley led the way. Buttercup stray, uh, stayed just behind, and they made, uh, and they made from the, on the outset very good time. The main thing, she realized, was to forget was to forget your childhood dreams. For the fire swamp was bad, but it wasn't that bad. The odor of the escaping gases, which at first seemed almost totally punishing, soon diminished through familiar familiarity. 
the sudden burst of flames were easily avoided because just before they struck, there was a deep kind of popping sound clearly coming from the vicinity where the flame would appear. Wesley carried his sword in his right hand, his long knife in his left, waiting for the first rouse, R-O-U-S, but none appeared. He had cut a very long piece of strong vine and coiled it over one shoulder and was busy working on it as they moved. What what we'll do once I've got this this properly done is, he told her, moving steadily on beneath the giant trees, we'll attach ourselves to each other. So that way no matter what no matter what the darkness no matter what the darkness, we'll be close. Actually, I think that's more precaution than necessary because to tell you the truth, I'm almost disappointed. This place is bad alright, but it's not that bad, don't you agree? Buttercup wanted to, to wanted to totally, and she would have too, only by then the snow sand had her. Wesley turned only in time to see her disappear. Buttercup had simply let her attention wander for a moment. The ground seemed solid enough, and she had no idea what snow sand looked like anyways. But once her front foot began to sink in, she could not pull back, and even before she could scream, she was gone. It was like falling through a cloud. The sand was the finest in the world, and there was no bulk in it whatsoever, and at first no unpleasantness. She was just falling gently through this soft powdery mass, falling further and further from anything resembling life, but she could not allow herself to panic. Wesley had instructed her on how to behave if this happened, and she followed his words. Now she spread her arms and spread her fingers and forced herself into the position resembling that of a dead man's float in swimming. All this because Wesley had told her to had told her to because the more she could spread herself, the slow the the slower she would sink. And the slower she sank, the quicker he could dive down after her and catch her. Buttercup's ears were now caked with snow sand all the way in, and her nose was filled with snow sand, both nostrils, and she knew if she opened her eyes, a million tiny fine bits of snow sand would seep behind her eyelids, and now she was beginning to panic badly. How long had she been falling? Hours, it seemed, and she was having pain in holding her breath. You must hold on till I find you, he had said. You must go into a dead man's float, and you must close your eyes and hold your breath, and I'll get get you, and we'll both have a wonderful story for our grandchildren. Buttercup continued to sink. The weight of the sand began to brutalize her shoulders. The small of her back began to ache. It was agony keeping her arms outstretched and her fingers spread when it was all so useless. The snow sand was heavier and heavier on her now as she sank always down. And was it bottomless? As the as they thought when they were children, did you just sink forever until the sand ate away at you and then did your poor bones continue to trip forever down? No, surely there had to be somewhere somewhere there had to somewhere be a resting place a resting place, Buttercup thought. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful thing. I'm so tired, so tired, and I want to rest and and Wesley, Wesley, come save me, she screamed, or started to, because in order to scream, she had to open, you have to open your mouth. So all she really got, got was the first sound of the, of the word wa. After that, the snow sand was down into her throat, and she was done. Wesley had made a terrific start before she had even entirely disappeared. He had dropped his sword and long knife and had gotten the vine coiled from his shoulders, it took him next to no time to knot one end around a giant tree, and holding tight to the free end, he simply dove headlong into the snow sand, kicking his feet as he sank for greater speed. There was no question in his mind of failure. He knew he would find her, and he would, 
and he knew she would be upset and hysterical and possibly even brain tumbled, but alive. And that was, in the end, the only fact, that was, in the end, the only fact of lasting importance. The snow sand ha had his ears and nose blocked, and he hoped she had not panicked and remembered to spread and remembered to spread eagle her body so that she could catch so that he could catch her quickly with his headlong dive if she remembered it wouldn't be that hard the same real the, the same really as rescuing a, a drowning swimmer in murky water they floated slowly down you drove Oh, you dove straight down, you kicked, you pulled with your free arm, and gained on them. You grabbed them, you brought them to the surface, and the only real problem would be convincing your grandchildren that such a thing had actually happened, and, and was not just another family fable. He was still concerning his mind with the infants yet unborn. When something happened, he had not counted on. The vine was not long enough. He hung suspended for a moment, holding to the end of it as it stretched straight up through the snow the snow the snow sand to the security of the giant tree to release the vine was truly madness there was no possible possibility of forcing your body all the way back up to the surface a few feet from ascension was possible if you kicked wildly but no more so if he let go of the vine and did not find her within a finger snap it was all up it was all up for both of them. Wesley left, let go of the vine without a qualm because he had come too far to fail now. Failure was not even a problem to be considered. Down he sank, then, and within a finger snap, he had his hand around her wrist. Wesley screamed, then himself in horror and surprise, as, and the snow sand gouged at his throat for what he had grabbed was a skeleton wrist bone only no flesh left at it what happened in snow sand once the skeleton was picked clean it would begin often to float like seaweed in a quiet tide shifting its this way and that sometimes surfacing more often than journeying through the snow sand for eternity wesley threw the wrist away and reached out blindly with both hands now grappling wildly to touch some part of her because failure was not a problem. Failure was not a problem, he told himself. It is not a problem to be considered, so forget failure. Just keep busy and find her. And he found her, her foot more precisely, and he pulled, pulled it to him. And then his arm was around her perfect wrist, a uh, waist, sorry, waist and... And he began to kick, kick with any strength left, needing now to rise the few yards to the end of the vine. The idea that it might be difficult to find a single vine strand in a small sea of snow sand never bothered him. Failure was not a problem. He would simply have to kick, and when he had kicked hard enough, he would rise, and when he had risen enough, he would reach out for the vine, and when he reached out, it would be there, and when it was there, he would tie her to it, and with his last breath, he would pull them both up to life. Which is exactly what happened. She remained unconscious for a very long time. Wesley busied himself as best he could, cleaning the snow sand from ears and nose and mouth, and, and most delicate of all, from beneath the lids of her eyes. The length of her quietness disturbed him vaguely. It was almost as if she knew she had died and was afraid to find out for a fact that it was true. He held her in his arms, rocked her slowly. Eventually, he was blinking. He was blink she, eventually, she was blinking. For a time, she looked around and around. We lived then, she managed finally. We're a hardy breed. What a wonderful surprise. No need. He was going to say no need for worry, but her panic struck too quickly. It was a normal enough reaction, and he did not try to block it, but rather held her firmly and let the hysteria run its course. She shuddered for a time, 
as if she fully intended to fly apart. But that was the wor but that was the worst. For there is for there it was, but a few minutes of quiet sobbing. Then she was buttercup again. Wesley stood buckled on his sword, replaced his long knife. Come, he said, we have far to go. Not until you tell me, she replied. Why must we endure this? Now is not the time, Wesley held out his hand. It is the time, she, she stayed where she was on the ground. Wesley sighed. She meant it. All right, he said finally. I'll explain, but we must keep going. Buttercup waited. We must get through the fire swamp, Wesley began, for, for one good and simple reason. Once he had started talking, Buttercup stood fo following closely behind him, and he, oh, as he went on, I have always intended getting to the far side. I had, I had not, I must admit, expected to go through around was my intention, but the ravine forced me to change. The good and simple reason, Buttercup prompted, on the far end of the fire swamp is the mouth of Great Eel Bay. The and anchored far out in the deepest waters of that bay is the great ship Revenge. The Revenge is the sole property of the dread pirate Roberts. Um, we're going to have to finish this later. We've been reading from The Princess Bride. It is a book by William Goldman. It is a hot fairy tale. If you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all the information will be in the description below. Also, if you want to join the Discord server, that information will be down there as well. Thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.